Welcome back to our series on statistical methods. I'm Mark Ledbetter. This is lecture 13. This is part 6 of chapter 3, and we're discussing one-way ANOVA. <clears throat> so far, we've talked about how to perform an ANOVA, and I've written down some steps that we need to take to do so. <clears throat> Once we've performed the ANOVA, we need to verify that the assumptions are met, and the, the order for this could be reversed <clears throat> But using the functions that we're using, uh, we run the ANOVA, and then we uh, usually, after the ANOVA has been run, then we can plot, and therefore, <clears throat> at that time, uh, using plotting the ANOVA allows us to verify that the assumptions are met. <clears throat> so if we verify the assumptions are met, and then we see that we have rejected H0, that the ANOVA is in fact statistically significant at our uh, uh, level of alpha, our significance level, <clears throat> then we probably want to estimate some population parameters. Specifically, we'll want to uh, estimate <clears throat> mu i, which are the treatment means. Remember that our model is can be written as mu i plus epsilon i j, i equals 1 to A and J equals 1 to N. And if the model is significant, if we reject H0, remember that H0 is that mu1 is equal to mu2 is equal to all, uh, all A treatment means are equal. <clears throat> so under H0, this uh, quantity doesn't change. We don't need the subscript. Under H0, if it's true, we have yij is equal to mu, the overall mean. Now, what you may, you can prove uh, algebraically that if these are equal, then all of them have to be equal to the overall mean. That's the only way that that can happen. Regardless of whether you have a balanced design or an unbalanced design, that is true. So then this can be reduced to y is equal to a constant. That's saying that you have a straight line at the level of mu for all values of x. <clears throat> and so it doesn't matter what the value of x is, y doesn't really change. Okay, So if we fail to reject h0, we don't need to estimate the uh, treatment means because we're saying that there's no difference in them. But we might want to estimate the overall mean in that case. <clears throat> and we can do that since they're all uh, equal, we can, and they are all distributed the same if the assumptions have been met, then we can just use a one uh, sample confidence interval to calculate uh, the confidence interval for mu using y dot dot bar, the overall uh, mean of the experiment. <clears throat> now, if we reject H0, then that says that these treatment means at least one of them is different. So then we would want to estimate mu sub i. And create a confidence interval for each of the treatment uh, means. And then we could use those confidence intervals to see if they overlap or if there's a difference in them. <clears throat> and if we wanted to, we could rewrite this as a regression equation and use this for prediction. Okay, So <clears throat> once we have rejected the null, so that's one thing we can do is create estimates of these population parameters. This, the other thing we can do is when we reject the null, we know that at least one mean is different from the others, but we don't know which one or ones, and we don't know how different they are from the others. And so those are things that we'd be interested in. Okay, So we can, we can test for this, and we perform something called post hoc testing. This is afterwards, but we'll talk about um, that. We can talk about comparisons, and then we can talk about, like, uh, uh, two sample pairwise differences in the means, but we can do more than pairwise. If we have more than two, which is usually what we're talking about with an ANOVA, if we have three or more levels or three or more treatments, then we have more than just uh, a pairwise comparison that we could make. We, if, if there's three or more, we can compare all three in a certain way, okay, depending on what we want to do. And we'll talk about that. So the first thing we're going to do is estimate the parameters, and we are going to do the first part, but not the second, because estimating the overall mean is, uh, is easy to do, but again, it's more interesting when you do not reject the null hypothesis. Okay. 
So, um, and if you're not rejecting the null hypothesis, you know how to do that with a one sample um, confidence interval that we've already gone over. So, <clears throat> a CI for the ith treatment mean. So, what we have is we have the general form, which is um, theta hat for the general form for a confidence interval is theta hat plus or minus the critical value times the standard error of theta hat, the estimate, not the parameter, because the parameter doesn't have a standard error, it's a constant. But the estimate, whatever we're using to estimate that parameter, and we can call it theta is the parameter, then theta hat would be the estimate, taking the standard error of that. Now again, our estimate of the ith treatment mean is going to be y i dot bar. Okay? And let's remember, so in order to do a um, a confidence interval, we not only need a uh, critical value, we need this standard error of the mean. So let's look at the uh, sum of squares error, because that's the first place that we would want to look for an error, uh, standard error. We're going to look at the SS error, okay? So that equation is given by the sum from i equals 1 to a and from j equals 1 to n of y i j minus y i dot bar quantity squared. Now if I look at the inner summation, it looks like a variance, a sample variance, but it's missing a 1 over n minus 1. Now if you have a balanced design, then you can multiply, this is a technique to make it look like a um, sample variance, n minus 1. If you don't have a um, balanced design, then it would be ni minus 1 over ni minus 1, but we'd have to put it inside the summation for i because it has the index i. Okay, So that's the uh, only difference in what we would do here, <clears throat> but we'd come out with basically the same result. So <clears throat> we're going to do this for the balance case. It's a little bit easier. I can multiply it on the outside. Multiply anywhere inside the first summation or even the second summation, but I don't need it there. And so we have i equals 1 to a, j equals 1 to n, y i j minus y i dot bar squared. And again, I can move this one inside the first summation. And when I do that, what I get is n minus 1 times the sum from i equals 1 to a of 1 over n minus 1 sum from j equals 1 to n of y i j minus y i dot bar squared. Now, this inner quantity is a sample variance for the ith treatment level. So I can rewrite this as n minus 1 sum from i equals 1 to a of si squared. Okay? <clears throat> so that is another way to write the sums of squares of the errors. Now, within the treatment, so the estimate of the within treatment variance can be given um, by uh, a pooled estimate. So if you remember, for our pooled estimate for two uh, samples of uneven size, we had n minus 1 times s1 squared plus n2 minus 1, s2 squared, over n1 minus 1 plus n2 minus 1. Okay? And we could extend this to a of these, just simply using the same pattern, plus n3 minus 1, okay? s, uh, s3 squared plus dot 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 plus um, n a minus 1 times s a squared, and then keep adding for each one of these in 3 minus 1, and then dot 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 plus um, n a minus 1. Now, when we have a, a balanced case, then we can simplify this so that we don't have the uh, subscripts here for the n's. They're all the same quantity. Okay, and I'll go repair that. <laughs> so we have uh, so n minus 1, n minus 1, 
n minus 1. And so when we look at this in the numerator, everything is multi every, every one of these s uh, squares, s sub i squared, they're all multiplied by n minus 1. So I can factor out the n minus 1 in the numerator. <clears throat> and then I'll have s1 squared plus s2 squared plus s3 squared plus dot, 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 all the way up to s sub a squared. So that can be written as the sum of s sub i squared from i equals 1 to a. And then on the bottom, we'll have a of these, and they're all the same, so a times n minus 1. And so what we have is we have SSE <clears throat> divided by AN minus A, which is equal to SSE over capital N minus A. This is the degrees of freedom of the error for a one-way ANOVA. <clears throat> and so this becomes the MSE. So, <clears throat> so now this is sigma hat squared. <clears throat> okay, so this is the pooled variance. And notice we didn't make any assumptions about the null hypothesis. Okay, so it's always, MSE is always an estimate. And we'll find that the MSE, the expected value of the MSE, is equal to sigma squared. It's an unbiased estimator. Now, let's think about the null hypothesis. So when the null hypothesis is true, then we have mu1 equal to mu2 equal to etc. mu a. <clears throat> in other words, we don't have a difference in the treatment means. They're all the same. And so when they're all the same, we can estimate the variance within the treatment okay, levels, between the treatment levels, as <clears throat> sigma hat over n squared. Um, so that would be the variance of the differences of the treatment levels, right? So that's going to be the sum of yi dot bar minus y dot dot bar quantity squared from i equals 1 to a over n, <clears throat> okay? And um, so, but in this case, um, n is going to be a minus or n minus 1, but so we're going to have um, a minus 1 here is the within treatment uh, difference, so the variation, okay? <clears throat> and so this is uh, not quite the MS treatment, okay? Now let's look at the MS treatment. That's going to be, remember the MS treatment is the double sum, I equals 1 to A, J equals 1 to N of the same quantity, YI dot bar minus Y dot dot bar, <clears throat> quantity squared. There's no J here in either one of these. So we're going to add this up N times. So we're going to end up with N, the sum of N times YI dot bar minus Y dot dot bar squared, and then the sum from i equals 1 to a, and we can pull that out because it doesn't have a subscript. For a balanced design, we can do that. For an unbalanced design, we'd have n sub i there, and it would stay, okay? And that would be, you'll find that that's the definition for the sum of squares treatment uh, for an unbalanced design. So we have n sum from i equals 1 to a, uh, y i dot bar minus y dot dot bar quantity squared over a minus 1, which is the degrees of freedom for the um, MSE. So um, this is equal to, so if we, if we solve this for sigma hat squared, we multiply n on both sides. And when we multiply n by both sides, what we end up with is that sigma hat squared is equal to n times the sum of yi dot bar minus y dot dot bar quantity squared over a minus 1, <clears throat> which is the ms treatment. And so ms treatment is equal to sigma hat squared. Okay, so that's our estimate of with uh, different, of with between treatment variation. Between treatment variation. Okay. Now, if these, so this 
So under H naught, then sigma hat squared is equal to MS treatment. All the time, um, MSE is equal to sigma hat squared. So un whether it's under the null or the alternative, MSE is always equal to sigma hat squared, but only under the null is MS treatment equal to sigma hat squared. So if, therefore, <clears throat> under H naught, MSE is equal to MS TRT. They're both estimates of sigma squared. And then, um, so they both become estimates of sigma squared, and so they're equal. That means that um, this implies that um, F equals MS TRT over MS E is equal to 1. Okay, <clears throat> And when they're not all the same, when the treatment means are not all equal, then the MS treatment is going to get larger. It's going to become larger and larger, but the MSE is going to is not is going to be um, smaller actually. So as you take overall total error, remember that we have SST equals SS treatment plus SSE. The the total tr um, sum of squares is not going to change. So if the total sums of squares doesn't change, and you make TRT the sum of the squares for treatment bigger, then that means that the sum of squares error has to get smaller because of this equation. And so is, if the means are different, MS treatment is going to get bigger, MSE is going to get smaller, and then MS treatment becomes bigger than MSE, and F becomes greater than 1. And so that's when we would reject the null, when F is uh, significantly different than one. <clears throat> okay. Now, under the un, regardless of whether we have the null hypothesis true or not, the expected value of the MSE is equal to sigma squared. And if we do not, um, if we do not assume the null hypothesis is true, and we take the expectation of MS treatment, then we do we end up with sigma squared plus this other term. Okay. So the only time so this other term is the n times the sum of, t of tau i divided by a minus 1. So under the null hypothesis, this has to be 0. This quantity would have to be 0 in order for um, ms treatment to equal sigma squared. That term would have to be 0. So under the null hypothesis, that has to be 0. a minus 1 is not going to change. That's never 0. And and having zero in the denominator doesn't help us anyway. Um, <clears throat> n can never be zero. It always has, always has to be greater than or equal to one, a sample of at least one. One is uninteresting, so it's usually greater than one. <clears throat> and so the only thing that could be equal to zero would be the sum of tau i. So under the null hypothesis, <clears throat> we have that the sum of tau i is equal to zero. And that, will, that means that... Um, mu i equals mu plus tau i, <clears throat> that uh, if, if these are all equal, <clears throat> then these are zero, okay? So if mu i's are all equal, then they're going to be equal to mu, and that means that tau i's have to be zero. So the sum of tau i's has to be zero, and that would imply that the treatment means are equal. So that would imply that um, mu i equals mu j for i not equal to j. Okay? <clears throat> okay. So that's what we're doing with the ANOVA. Now, so we need to find this uh, 100 times 1 minus alpha percent confidence interval for mu sub i. Okay? And so, again, we need to find the... Um, we need to find the critical value. <clears throat> now, the critical value is T sub alpha over 2 with N minus A degrees of freedom. Okay? <clears throat> and so what we're going to see is <clears throat> we're going to have <clears throat> for mu I, 
we're going to have y i dot bar <clears throat> plus or minus t sub alpha over 2 n minus a. And then we need the um, standard error of mu sub i is what we want. <clears throat> okay, So the standard error of mu sub i is going to be, uh, or, or I'm sorry, of y, not mu sub i, of y i dot bar. That's what we need. Y i, oh, I did it again. <laughs> y i dot bar. <clears throat> well, remember that this is going to equal sigma squared over n. Okay, sigma hat. And so this is going to be the standard error. It's going to be the square root <clears throat> of the variance of y i dot bar. And we showed that the uh, variance of y i dot bar is um, sigma squared divided by n. And this is approximately equal to the square root of sigma hat squared over n, which is equal to the square root of mse divided by n. So this is our standard error. So this is going to be mse divided by n. And there is our confidence interval for yi bar. Okay. And remember that n minus a is equal to a n minus 1 if, <clears throat> if it's a balanced design. If it's not a balanced design, n minus a is going to equal <clears throat> n 1 minus 1 plus n2 minus 1 plus na minus 1 if it's if it's not a balanced design okay <clears throat> but it will always be n minus a as the degrees of freedom here <clears throat> okay now if we reject the null hypothesis null hypothesis then the treatment means are not all equal and we want to know which ones are different. Now, <clears throat> we have to talk about um, pre-planned tests here. And <clears throat> I can, we can come up with a confidence interval easily if we're looking for just one of them. So if before we uh, looked at the data, we said, you know, I think it's going to be um, <clears throat> the fourth is going to be bigger than the third. So, so why? 4 dot bar will be bigger than y3 dot bar, <clears throat> and so that will be greater than 0. So I want to look at this comparison. And if you determine that ahead of time, and that's the only comparison you want to look at, then you can use this confidence interval. And we'll talk about why you can't uh, do this after the fact. There's a different method that we have to use to control for a change in our type 1 error for multiple. So it's really important that we're talking about pre-planned, I called it pre-hoc, <clears throat> um, not post-hoc, meaning you don't afterwards, this is after we perform the test, but um, if we reject the null, th that's the only time this is interesting, because <clears throat> otherwise there's no difference. But we had to pre-plan it. I shouldn't say pre-hoc, I should say pre-planned. Now in some uh, studies in some fields you can do this, but when you're doing exploratory designs of analysis, which w that's what most of mine were, you couldn't do this. You had to look at the data and then say, I think these are different. Let's test where, whether all of them are different or this combination is different than zero, this contrast, and we'll talk about those shortly. <clears throat> but if we're talking about two means being different, so uh, yi dot bar and I just said yi prime dot bar, just some different. I didn't want to use j's because we've used j for 1 to n, and later on we'll use k. So I, <clears throat> I didn't have a very good letter to use here, so I figured that I could say that i, <clears throat> I is not equal to i prime. Okay, <clears throat> So it's just a different mean, so please uh, let the... Uh, don't let the notation stump you here. <clears throat> so again, we have this difference in means, and then we need a critical value that goes with it. And then we need a standard error of that difference in means. And so this turns out to be <clears throat> t alpha over 2 
Um, <clears throat> n minus a. And then the square root of 2 times m s e over n. So we've got this 2 here now. Why? So let's take a look at the variance of yi dot bar minus yi prime dot bar. <clears throat> and if we do this, going back to the properties of variance, we will have variance of the first term, yi dot bar, minus 2 times the covariance of yi dot bar, comma, yi prime dot bar, <clears throat> plus the variance of yi i prime dot bar. <clears throat> now, uh, y, the, the treatment levels, y i dot bar is independent of y i prime dot bar. <clears throat> so that makes this covariance, when they're ind independent, the covariance is zero. And so that makes this the variance of y i dot bar plus the variance of y i prime dot bar, <clears throat> and we said that this was equal to sigma hat squared over n for both of them, because they're both means, and so this is 2 sigma hat squared over n, and we can rewrite that as 2 times mse divided by n. <clears throat> okay, so that is the reason that we use this 2 here. So this is the square root of 2 times MSE over N. For unbalanced, let me write that below. So <clears throat> for unbalanced designs, Y I dot bar minus Y I prime dot bar plus or minus T alpha over 2 N minus A <clears throat> degrees of freedom for the sum of the squares error. This will be the square root <clears throat> of M S E times 1 over N I plus 1 over N I prime. And of course, when ni and ni prime are the same, then this reduces to 2 over n sub i, whatever, and or n. Okay? So this is, for unbalanced designs, our 90, or our, um, this is our 1 minus alpha times 100% ci. That's how it's often written. I often just say 1 minus alpha ci. These are identical. It's just the units that have changed, okay? So the uh, format, if you will. <clears throat> okay, so now <clears throat> we, we're talking about um, post-hoc test. Um, we could determine this pre-hoc or pre-test, pre-planned, um, but again, it has to be something that's already been um, tested in order for us to do this. So, uh, in, in other words, if you've already used a psychology scale and you know what has happened in other populations, then you will make a pre-hoc um, or a pre-planned test for contrast and differences before you even do the test. And by doing so, you reduce the one-way error because you're only choosing uh, a few of these. Okay, at a time. <clears throat> if you choose too many, if you do something we call data snooping, then we're going to inflate the type 1 error, and then we will have an issue. So right now, we want to talk about simultaneous uh, confidence intervals. These could also be simultaneous pairwise contrasts. So that's another name for these. We want to calculate the difference in multiple combinations of the means. So you see right here, these multiple combinations, these are contrasts because we're going to uh, add and subtract these. We're going to set, say, mu1 
uh, plus mu2, the average of that, equal to mu3 plus mu4, that, that average. <clears throat> and we can solve this. We can multiply 2 by both sides. Sorry about that. <clears throat> and they cancel out. And we're left with mu1. Let me zoom in. Mu1 plus mu2 equals mu3 plus mu4. And that can be rewritten as mu1 plus mu2. Subtract mu3 and mu4 from both sides. equal to zero. So because we're taking this and subtracting, let's say that, <clears throat> that's as a contrast because there's a subtraction. There's a difference or contrast between these two and these two. Okay. Now, so when we do this, we're going to let r be the number of confidence intervals that are to be calculated. Okay? And the probability that all r confidence intervals are simultaneously correct. What does that mean? The confidence interval you can think of as, I'm going to call the contrast or the, the differences as mu. You're going to say this is between L and U, two values. This is going to be the population parameter. And a confidence interval, if it's correct, then that population parameter is somewhere between L and U. Not necessarily in the middle, just anywhere in there. Okay. When you remember how we studied confidence intervals, we talked about whether the we talked about whether the confidence interval actually contained the true population parameter or not, and that was called a coverage probability or the confidence level. And so, if we were if we had a ninety five percent confidence level, then ninety five percent of the time that we calculated uh, that we took a sample and calculated the confidence interval, ninety five percent of the time that confidence interval would actually contain the true parameter. And 5% of the time, it would actually not contain the parameter. And we didn't care if the parameter was right at one edge or the other. It's just somewhere in the confidence interval. That is, the confidence interval is correct if the population parameter we're estimating actually falls inside of it. So the probability that all of them are simultaneously correct <clears throat> is 1 minus um, R times alpha. So we call an experiment-wise error rate or family of confidence interval, family error rate, we call that R times alpha, the number of confidence intervals times alpha. <clears throat> because for each confidence interval, we would have, we would set alpha as the type 1 error, and then every time we do another one, we have another alpha. So <clears throat> the overall confidence coefficient is um, 1 minus uh, R times alpha, okay? Now, there are different methods to handle this. The first one's called Fisher's Least Significant Difference, or LSD, Fisher's LSD method. This only controls for the individual pairwise comparison, alpha. So we're not adjusting anything. So it does not adjust or control for experiment-wise or family error rates. So it does not do that. So we basically have exactly the same confidence interval that we just talked about. And this is for um, an unbalanced design. If it's a balanced design, this uh, right here, this term, if it's balanced design, will reduce to that, which is exactly what we saw here. So here is it's the same as this or as this if it's balanced. So the confidence interval doesn't change. So not changing this is um, the uh, same as just doing a confidence interval of differences, one of them. Okay, But here we may do several, and we're only concerned about the pairwise. This is not a conservative method. A conservative method makes it harder for you to reject the null. This uh, makes it easier for you to say that the two uh, means are different. Okay, but remember, if you perform several of these at the same time, you're increasing your overall error rate uh, for th that, and, and you don't keep it at alpha. So this can be very dangerous if, you're, if you don't know what you're doing. Okay, <clears throat> so for a hypothesis test, we would be testing that mu1 or mu i is, different, is equal to mu i prime, and the alternative would be that they're different. Okay. We could rewrite these as mu i minus mu i prime equals zero, or in both cases, mu i 
minus mu i prime not equal to zero. Okay? So making it a contrast. And so we have the difference in these uh, sample means divided by the um, standard error for the test statistic. And so this test statistic has a t um, n minus a distribution with n minus a degrees of freedom. And if we want to talk about the rejection region, we would reject the null because this is a two-sided uh, test. We would reject h naught if the absolute value of t naught is greater than t sub alpha over 2 n minus a. Okay, so this is supposed to be an m. So that's, that's a rejection region right here. So that's for the Fisher LSD method. Now let's talk about the Bonferroni method. This is a very conservative method. So uh, logically speaking, Bonferroni said, let's set, let's, uh, if we're going to increase by a factor of r, let's adjust for that. Let's take alpha and divide it by r and set that equal to our new alpha. And so we substitute that in for alpha over 2. We substitute in um, uh, so one half, so alpha over two divided by r is equal to alpha divided by two times r. Invert and multiply the fractions. And so that's what we substitute in for the uh, critical value. We change alpha over two to alpha over two r. And then the degrees of freedom stays the same, and the multiplier here, the S standard error, stays the same. And this has an overall uh, experiment-wise uh, type 1 error of alpha. Okay? This makes the confidence intervals longer because it makes this bigger, a bigger value than just for alpha over 2 because alpha over 2r is smaller. And this works really well unless we have too many of these simultaneous confidence intervals, and then this becomes it becomes almost impossible to see any differences between the means. So we have to be careful with this method and use it when we only have a couple of, uh, of uh, hypotheses of interest. Okay. So again, we have basically the same uh, test statistic. We, we have the same test statistic as for the Fisher LSD. The difference is the rejection region. So this is still, T naught is still distributed as T with N minus A degrees of freedom, but now our rejection region is when T naught, the absolute value of T naught is greater than T alpha over 2 R N minus A. So this has changed, so this number, this T score, or T value, has gotten bigger than for the unadjusted, and now it's more difficult to, uh, you have to have a more extreme value of T naught in order to reject the null hypothesis that they are the same. And finally, we're going to talk about Tukey's method, and this is for um, all possible simultaneous differences of treatment means, pairwise. Uh, let's see, simultaneous. Yeah, pairwise. And so the overall significance level, if n is equal, if it's a balanced design, then the overall experiment-wise error is exactly equal to alpha. If n is unequal, then it's at most alpha. That means it's less than or equal to alpha. And so this implies that um, <clears throat> 1 minus um, alpha, that, that uh, the confidence level, is greater than or equal to 1 minus alpha, okay? Because alpha can be smaller, which would make 1 minus alpha bigger, but it can't be bigger than alpha. So if it's equal to alpha, this is 1 minus alpha. If it's smaller than alpha, then it's bigger than 1 minus alpha, okay? So that means that the coverage probability or the confidence level is at least 1 minus alpha, and that's how we like to perform these tests, at least 1 minus alpha. So we have the, the hypothesis statement for i not equal to i prime, i equals 1 to p, where p is the number, where p is basically equal to a. Okay? <clears throat> so the test statistic is given by q equals the maximum 
um, treatment level mean minus the minimum treatment level mean. And the book does a very nice job of explaining why this is and deriving this. We won't do that. <clears throat> Divided by the square root of MSE over 2 times 1 plus n over i, uh, 1 over n plus i, 1 over n sub i plus 1 over n sub i prime. Okay? And remember, when they're equal, this is going to reduce to 2 over n. <clears throat> and then this 2 and this 2 will cancel, and you'll have MSE over, the, over n inside the square root. So this is called the studentized range statistic. The critical region is given by the absolute value of yi dot bar minus yi prime dot bar and greater than this quantity which we call t sub alpha. t sub alpha is equal to this quantity here. So it's q sub alpha uh, as a function of p where p is the number of treatment means which is a and f is the degrees of freedom of the MSE. <clears throat> and you'll see we have a table 7 that has the Q sub alpha P of F. And then we have the square root of the MSE over 2 times 1 over <clears throat> N sub I plus 1 over N sub I prime. Okay, So this is our um, tested, this is our uh, critical value. Okay, This is our new critical value. And so if the absolute value of the difference is greater than this, then we reject the null. <clears throat> and the confidence interval is now going to be yi prime, uh, yi dot bar prime, uh, yi dot bar minus yi prime dot bar <clears throat> plus or minus this t sub alpha. So it's um, <clears throat> it's the standard error and the critical value, which is interesting. <clears throat> and we go to table sam seven <clears throat> and alpha. Interestingly, is the right tail probability, but you see that this is greater than, <clears throat> and so. By taking greater than, uh, <clears throat> this looks like it's not a, it, it may be a skewed distribution, so that is why, like the F statistic, we're looking for uh, just greater than, okay? <clears throat> and the absolute value. We don't care which one is bigger than the other, just that they're bigger. So <clears throat> just like the F test, we're only looking for a right-tailed test. Alpha's in the right tail. So sometimes the <clears throat> ANOVA results in us rejecting H0, but none of the pairwise... Confidence intervals, which is mu i minus mu i prime, is significant. How does that happen? Well, here's the answer. Remember that f is equal to ms treatment divided by mse. And, but this tests all possible combinations or differences of the treatment means, not just the pairwise. So all possible. So it could be that one particular uh, contrast is significant and none of the others are. Okay. <clears throat> um, so differences between two or more means are called contrast. So let's look at some examples. And I have that repeated. <clears throat> so let's go back to our example um, of the wafer etch. And I, I obtained this information from table two in our uh, code file where we put together the descriptive statistics. So here are the means of the different and you'll notice they're all increasing from 1 to 4. <clears throat> and here's the standard errors, uh, or the standard deviations. And then here's the MSE. Remember, that's our sigma hat squared. We need that. So um, <clears throat> there's another piece of code that gave me the MSE. Uh, that would be the ANOVA. And <clears throat> the ANOVA 1 in our code file. And then I looked up T sub alpha over 2 N minus A. So alpha... Let alpha equal 0.05 by default, unless we tell you anything else. So alpha over 2 is 0.025, and then n was equal to 20, and a was equal to 4. So 20 minus 4 is 16. That's 2.120. <clears throat> so a 95% confidence interval for yi dot bar is yi dot bar plus or minus this t times the se. And remember that the se is the square root of mse over n. And here's our critical value. And so if, if we do it for y1 dot bar, we have 550, this is 1.2. Got a little happy with the typing of twos. 551.2 plus or minus 2.12 uh, times the square root of 333.7 over 5. So that turns out to be this. <clears throat> and that gives us a confidence interval of 533.9 to 565 or 568.5. So we are... 
95% confident that the interval, and then we write out the interval, 533.9 to 568.5, contains the true uh, uh, difference, or the true, it's not a difference, the true um, mean of treatment level one, or Y, uh, let's see, mu sub one, sub one, um, or <clears throat> at power equals 160 watts, um, at power equal 160 watts using a random sample of n1 equals 5, or n equals 5. Okay, so this is how we interpret a confidence interval. So make sure that you remember that from Chapter 2. Um, <clears throat> this is the, the format. We are blank percent confidence that the interval, whatever that is, contains the true, and then this is the... Um, in words, the estimate, or theta hat. Okay. <clears throat> so doing this in R, here's the code. And when I print out the LSD, it gives me statistics, and it tells me MSE right here. It also gives me the degrees of freedom of the MSE. It gives me mu hat, or y dot dot bar. It gives me CV. I haven't figured out exactly what this is. And um, the T value and then LSD, which is their uh, test statistic. And it tells me under parameters that it's the Fisher LSD, meaning that there's no adjustment, P value adjustment. Um, <clears throat> the name of the treatment, treatment name, or name.t for treatment, is power. Number of treatment levels is four, so this is A. And then alpha was set at 0.05. You can change these things, but I didn't change them up here. I left them at the default. And then it gives me the means. And here is for Y1, or power, equal 160. We have 533. If we round it to one decimal place, 533.9, which is exactly what we got, and 568.5 to one decimal place. It also gives us minimum, maximum, and the quartiles. And then it compares treatment... Um, <clears throat> 220, it calls this A, group A. I don't know why it starts with the largest, but it did. And so it says it's, it's, it's only the same as itself. If it had B here, it would say that it was the same as, uh, that the confidence intervals for 220 and 200 overlapped. And if it had C, it would say, it would also mean that um, the, the confidence interval for 180 overlapped with it. But that's not what we have here. All of them only have themselves, starting at A, whoops, Starting at A, they only have themselves uh, as being the same. So they're only the same as themselves. That means all of them are different using the Fisher LSD method. <clears throat> now here is a way to do this manually. Okay. And then it prints out, uh, oh, so I'm sorry. So this is the pairwise differences, all of them using the Fisher LSD method. So I manually um, calculated this because I uh, wanted to make sure that it was right. And so you can use that. And here's the uh, difference in means. I have y1 minus y2 dot bar, um, and I couldn't do the notation, but you can see which one is which. And remember, y1 is less than y2, y2 is less than y3, y3 is less than y4, and so forth. So all of these are negative, and then here are their, so these are their estimates, and then here are their 95% um, confidence intervals using uh, unadjusted Fisher LSD method. So all of the, the differences. <clears throat> okay, then the Bonferroni method, um, I have one, two, three, four, five, uh, let's see, three, four, five, six different. So R is equal to six. So, <clears throat> so we have 0.05 divided by 12 <clears throat> as our um, 
new alpha, alpha dot R. <clears throat> and so that's what I've done here. And then we come up with the T value for the Bonferroni. And then we find these uh, confidence intervals. And again, I've manually uh, calculated this. And you can look through that code and use it. You have to modify it when you do other just changing from power to something else. <clears throat> and then here are the simultaneous 95% Bonferroni adjusted confidence intervals for the difference of mean etch rate by power level. So again, I have the treatment differences listed over here. <clears throat> and now I have uh, different... Um, upper and lower confidence levels. And let's take a look at these. Um, this is the Bonferroni, and this is the unadjusted, or LSD, Fisher LSD. And you'll see, if you look at this one, <clears throat> that this is a smaller confidence interval, that the difference between these two is like uh, 49 or something. <clears throat> and the difference between these is almost 70. So the Bonferroni gives us wider confidence intervals. <clears throat> so <clears throat> here we have an overlap between uh, this value and this value. So for, <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, that's not how we look at this. So <clears throat> neither, none of these, though, contain zero. So none of these, they're both, they're all negative. <clears throat> so even with the Bonferroni, the mean difference is they're all different, is what it says. <clears throat> and that's pretty impressive. Then there was Tukey, <clears throat> as we mentioned. So using uh, Tukey, and I've just programmed it so it gives us a nice table. And uh, <clears throat> I did the same up here. Let's see, did I give you the code for it? I don't think I did. Yes, I did. Okay, so there's the code for the table. And then <clears throat> here's the Tukey method. And so we have um, the differences. And here is the, uh, now they did it by the larger minus the smaller. <clears throat> and so they're positive. All the differences are positive. These estimates will be the same except the positive instead of the negative. And now <clears throat> this, you'll see that these intervals are somewhere between, they're not as long as the Bonferroni, but they're not as short as the Fisher LSD. They fall somewhere in between. So this is a good um, <clears throat> a compromise between the unadjusted and the fully adjusted. So <clears throat> the Tukey method is often used by uh, a lot of practitioners because it's a, um, <clears throat> it does adjust for the uh, experiment-wise um, confidence level, uh, but um, <clears throat> it's not as conservative as the Bonferroni method. So if you have questions, come to virtual office hours. Or you can email me if you need help before then. I'm happy to help you. Please take care of yourself, stay safe, and we hope to see you next time.